Hello, Norman. We are so excited to have you join us this morning for a virtual open house to discuss the special election coming up on Tuesday, November 12th. As I'm sure you're all aware, we have recently acquired a public transportation bus system for our community, formerly known as CART. While CART still exists on campus with three campus routes, we have contracted with Embark to continue running a bus system that is so vital to our community, which is evidenced by over 350,000 rides given last year to residents other than OU students. Today we're going to answer your questions about that specific public transit and parking fund and sales tax initiative, but I want to emphasize from the beginning what an excellent opportunity it is to fund this vital service without raising sales tax above its current levels. So. We're ready for your questions. We've got city staff here that can answer anything you can throw at us. So let's get started. Let's go ahead and introduce the staff that we have here. Hi, I'm Catherine Walker, the city attorney. I'm Anthony Francisco, the finance director. Good morning, I'm Daryl Pyle, the city manager for the city of Norman. Bria Clark, mayor of Norman. Good morning, I'm Sean O'Leary, the city director of public works. We are managing the bus transit system in our department. And I'm Taylor Johnson, the city's public transit coordinator. Okay, so we'll get started with just a general question. How did the city come to own the bus system? I suppose I'll take this one. <laughs> uh, so it was about a year ago, we were notified by the University of Oklahoma that they were interested in severing the 30 year partnership that we'd had of kind of a joint partnership in running the citywide bus system. The University of Oklahoma was actually the designee for the federal funding and this past summer we took a literal act of the governor but now the city is the designee for those federal funds to the tune of two million dollars a year to help us run the system which costs approximately 5.3 million dollars. And so while we understand that the university needed to do what they needed to do, we want to make sure that this service continues in Norman especially because people depend on it now to get to jobs, medical appointments, and just around town to run errands and see family, but it also positions us to really take advantage of regional transit as that comes online. Now, how did the city end up with a funding gap where the university did not have one? Great question. So I'll turn that over to the finance director. Well, I would first say that OU did have a funding gap. Um, that's one of the reasons that they wanted to um, get out of the public transit business. Um, but the reason that the gap exists and that it exists in most public transit systems is that um, there are a lot of the services that are under the public transit umbrella that do not and cannot pay for themselves from a fare-based, um, uh, fee-based service. Um, so those services are a public service, They're just, just like police services or, or fire services. Public transit is um, historically and traditionally a public service paid for by, by the taxpayers. Okay, and is there anything that you'd like to add to that, Sean? I might, if I may, thank you, Annalise. We just add that the, the, the number that the mayor quoted, $5.3 million, uh, first of all, it's estimated that it's going to cost that. We've never run a system like this before, so we're doing our best to estimate the cost of operation and capital costs. And there is a, a built-in number in that, in that estimate for uh, capital replacements of buses, uh, upgrades of bus stops, uh, fare boxes, any number of things that we need to do to keep this system running or to modernize the system. And so it's not just operational cost, it is capital plus operational. And um, can you talk through some of the, those funding areas that we have? Where are we receiving our funding from? Sure, happy to. Um, so uh, the mayor mentioned $2 million in federal transit administration funds. Uh, this was the same, generally the same source of funding that the university was receiving. Uh, we will, uh, the city council has increased its obligation from uh, an amount last year of six hundred and. $35,000 to $1.1 million, so a really major increase in our general fund obligation there. Um, we, we, they did collect fares, the university did, but so far since we've taken over the system, we've chosen to run the system free of charge, no, no fares yet. That will be a question that we will have going forward into next year, I'm, I'm sure. 
Um, the, uh, there, are, there is funding that comes from the Oklahoma Department of Transportation to all transit agencies in Oklahoma. There are 35 transit agencies in this state. We are one of those 35 that receives a small amount, about $120,000 this year. Uh, we do get a little bit of advertising uh, revenue from uh, the advertising we do on the buses and at the bus stops. What else am I missing? That's generally the, the, uh, the major sources, but none of those other sources, whether it be the ODOT sources or the advertising, really adds up, frankly, to substantial uh, revenues. And that's why we have this big gap in funding to operate the system as it is today. So I've got a public question here. Why did the, why did Noman jump into this and not perform due diligence on true costs of acquiring the bus service? So how did we not know about these expenses? No, that's a great question. Appreciate it. Um, it feels like we jumped in. I, 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 I'll grant you that. That's not a bad uh, choice of words uh, because as the mayor said, it came at us very rapidly. Um, first thing I would say is that the, what we learned is this has never been done in, the, in this country that we could find where a, a, a very mature transit system, a 30-year-old transit system, was transferred over to another agency. So we had a very steep learning curve. Even our partners at the FTA, uh, as much as they were helpful to us, they couldn't give us a, a manual on how to do this because they had never done it in this region. Um, that 12 months between August of 2018 and, and effectively July 1st of 2019 moved very quickly. We had a lot to do, a lot to think about. Um, I would say that we did our best. We, we did our due diligence on the entire system. We did our due diligence on financing. We knew that we were going to be short on financing. We had multiple meetings with city council, multiple public accessible meetings. Um, so you can look back in the record and see that it, it wasn't something that we did without a great deal of consideration and thought. Uh, but we had a, a hard deadline. The university gave us until the end of June to make this happen, and we could not, uh, they would not negotiate otherwise. So we, we had to meet that date of July 1st. And one of the things we're most proud of is that we met it. Um, we, the buses never stopped running. There was never a, a break in service in this system, and there were many in the, in the community that didn't think we were going to accomplish that. So I think a lot of credit to the city of Norman, the council and the staff and others, uh, and our partner at Embark to make that happen. Great. Um, so another public question we have here is, are, there's a 100% fare increase set to go into effect Friday. Is that still the case? No. Um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> had to talk think a little about bit that about for a minute. The fares um, and how we're handling that now and how we'll be handling that in the future because currently we're not collecting. Fares. That's correct. So Thank you. It took me a minute. To, we'll slow on the uptake there. But uh, so when we when we started the transfer there in July, uh, we made a very conscious decision with council's uh, obviously endorsement to not charge fares as the university had been charging previously, for a number of reasons. One, uh, really, we we were just learning our way through this process, and we felt like it was reasonable to uh, give free fares uh, and to encourage the use of the system. Uh, but we, at that time, we projected that by the end of October, we might be in a position to change that or, or add fares back. Uh, frankly, in the last few weeks, we concluded that we weren't ready to do that. Council uh, uh, agreed, and, and Council recently extended that uh, free fare period until the end of this calendar year, December 31st. By that time, we will have had the election. We'll know where we are with financing. We will have learned a lot more about uh, our users and fares and so on and so forth. And council will have to make a decision before the 1st of January of 2020 as to if we're gonna have fares, what the fares will be, uh, how much they will be and, and how we'll collect those. So lots to, to think about and do there. Um, there aren't very many transit systems in the country or in Oklahoma that, that offer free fares. So if we, if we went that route, we would be very unique, not that it's wrong, but it would be uh, very unusual to have a bus system that, that offers free rides. And if I, if I can add to that, when we recognize that the revenue anticipated from fares, if we were to have adopted and implemented the former cart rate structure, would have generated approximately $50,000 a year in revenue. The cost of implementing that fare 
um, in the new system operated by the city of Norman would have also required a, an investment in the actual fare box, the hardware to receive those fares as people climb onto the bus. And that was an investment of over $350,000 that didn't need to be made initially or immediately. So um, by not collecting the fares, we're actually able to push back uh, an investment of over $300,000 into the existing bus fleet. So definitely a decision made, eyes wide open, but there are lots of ramifications that added value to our transition and opening the system under Embark without that fee. I'm actually glad that you brought up the fare boxes. We have a question here um, regarding the fare boxes, mentioning the cost that it would take to implement them. Um, so when will we have new fare boxes and why weren't they fixed before turning over the buses? So why weren't the fare boxes fixed to what we need before we got received the buses? I can jump in a little bit about that. So at the retreat in July, we were talking about what the fares would be. And Mr. O'Leary explained the cost, the $350,000 figure and how we want to make it free during the transition. And so the discussion about having fares at all came up because again, it would take several years to make that money back with a $350,000 investment. And so we wanted to take our time before making such an investment because there is interest in council and in at least considering whether or not we want to make it free permanently. The downside to doing so would be the goal of regional transit is so it feels familiar wherever you go. And so if we had free Embark buses in Norman, that wouldn't be the case in Oklahoma City. So we have not had that discussion yet. And so it definitely wasn't something we wanted to rush into with such a big expense. If I may add to, the, to that, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> this uh, very high cost for fare box um, uh, upgrades, if you will, would put us in line with what uh, people are seeing on the Embark buses in Oklahoma City. It's a very sophisticated device. It takes all kinds of you know, credit cards and debit cards and cash and coins and, and you name it. Uh, very uh, high-tech devices. That said, the University of Oklahoma was operating on a very primitive system of fare boxes. They, they didn't have that kind of fare box. Literally, they had a cash box and that's, that's how they took fares. They, they had a lot of uh, fare uh, cards, uh, monthly uh, uh, cards and so on. And so we're going from a very primitive system, theoretically, to a very advanced system. And therein lies the cost of that, of upgrading those boxes on 28 different buses. If I may add to that, and I'm going to take off my finance director hat and, and put on my bus rider hat now. Um, this is my Embark day pass card that I bought yesterday. And as Sean is saying, it's, it's, it's very scientific and very expensive. It's electronic. And if you, I, I don't know if you can read that on the camera, but it's time stamped. Um, so what you're buying in this case is a day pass and it's a 24 hour period from the time that you buy the pass. So it has to be time stamped. It has to be able to slide and it has a card reader as Sean is talking about. All of those things are in this card. So each of those fare boxes cost about $50,000 to do all of those technological things that we're talking about here. And that's an investment that we have not made for Norman yet. But in order to equalize the systems for Embark Norman with Embark Oklahoma City, we would have to make that investment. Thank you for that. So we have a in terms of equipment, we also received buses from OU, correct? Can you talk to us about our current fleet? Happy to, and uh, Taylor may need to chime in here. Um, so when the transfer was occurring, um, I might clarify that process. First, the University of Oklahoma was working with the FTA, the Federal Transit Administration, to remove themselves from what had been a 30-year relationship and we were entering into the, a relationship with the FTA to be a new operator. So the university was negotiating for how many buses they would keep and how many they would give uh, back to us as a new operator and so on. And that, would, that went on for several months. Ultimately, we received 28 uh, buses, um, various sizes, some very large buses, some smaller buses, a few uh, smaller vehicles for operational purposes. Uh, and uh, on any given day, we are using about 18 or 19 of those on a, on a heavy day of operation. So we have a little bit of a, of a cushion like any good fleet should have because 
on any given moment a bus might need maintenance and service and that sort of thing. So we have a little bit of cushion in the numbers of buses. The problem is that many of these, most of these are old, average age, nine or ten years old, average mileage, 200,000 miles. So think about that in terms of your own vehicle at 200,000 miles, bad things start happening to engines and transmissions and, and so on. Now on the surface, these buses have been taken care of very well. In fact, we had an incident with a council member last week where they were riding on a 16-year-old bus and thought it was newer because it is so clean and uh, so well kept on the inside and the surface. What, they, what he wasn't seeing was the condition of the engine and the transmission, which is where our concern lies. And that's why we have put in some capital funding into this budget to replace those buses. It will take a number of years to do that, just like it does today with trash trucks and police cars and fire trucks. We, we are in the fleet business in a very big way in the city of Norman, like any large city, and the bus system will follow that same set of protocols. We, we will never be able to replace all the old buses at one time. That's just not practical or reasonable. Uh, so we have to put more money into the maintenance of the buses to keep them running, and we're doing that fairly well. Um, we have our days. We're still learning about the system, still learning about the, the bus technologies, um, but uh, doing pretty well. The, 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 the system is working as we had hoped it would. So talking about the buses themselves, I know that the university had some newer buses. Why wasn't Norman able to get those buses and why didn't we do a fuller inspection to make sure that we were getting sure. good product? Well, I'll take that. Sure. Um, we actually received uh, the two newest buses that the fleet had to offer. They uh, were delivered to OU in um, June and hadn't even been on the road yet. So we did receive uh, two very, very new buses. The next two uh, newest vehicles were two trolley over-the-road buses that the university decided to keep because of the nature of the campus transportation and that look that they had, and those were 2018 vehicles. And then the next two set of uh, newest vehicles are 2015 models, and so uh, the university retained those. But after that, the rest of the vehicles are older, um, 2003s, 2008s, 2010s. And so um, that's how kind of the uh, that's, that's the look of the new vehicles in the fleet and how um, those were allocated to, to each agency. Um, yeah. I would only add to that, we negotiated very carefully. The university was a, really a good partner uh, throughout the negotiations. Um, whether it was buses or cameras on the buses or software to operate the, the dispatching system, there were many, many elements to this system that we inherited and they were good partners throughout that negotiation. Uh, but they too were looking out for their interests, just like we were looking out for our interests, and they were going to continue to operate a 12 bus campus route system. Uh, that was their charge from their administration, and so naturally they were trying to get as much of the of the system that they needed to continue on, uh, just like we were as well. I think in the end we we uh, kind of you know split the sheets and got somewhere in the middle, like, like any good negotiation would do. Um, and what are the plans for the current transfer center? Transfer station, uh, for those who don't know, um, is located on Brook Street, uh, just north of the duck, what people call the duck pond around, uh, that, around the OU campus. A uh, very prominent site and had been uh, uh, developed and installed by the university, I'm going to say about five or six years ago, something like that. Um, so we are continuing to use that. That was part of a negotiation again. The university has been a good uh, partner in allowing us to continue to operate that, or they're operating the transit station, and we are uh, using it as part of our system. Uh, that's one of many things that we'll have to reevaluate uh, over the next couple of years as to whether that is the best place for us to operate a transit system uh, uh, station or, or not. Um, but it's working well. It, it, the, these are the users of this system are accustomed to that. That's where they transfer between buses and routes, and we didn't want to upset uh, the process or confuse our customers and it's been a really great relationship uh, since we transferred over in, in July. Great. Jumping back to the bus maintenance, why doesn't Embark provide maintenance as they were initially going to and how would it, how much would it cost to have them perform the maintenance versus having the taxpayers 
perform the maintenance? Yeah, great question. Again, I might elaborate a bit. Embark is a public trust of the city of Oklahoma City, operates the bus system, actually operates the streetcar system in Oklahoma City as well. And one of our early decisions throughout the previous year was we really concluded that we could not get up to speed as a city organization and hire, you know, 30 drivers and dispatchers and all that sort of thing. So we went to uh, the best source, which was the best bus operator in Oklahoma, which is Embark, negotiated a contract. They were very kind to do that with us. Uh, they didn't really need this, frankly, in their system, but they were a good partner and a good professional uh, operator to take us on. Throughout that negotiation, they quickly came to the conclusion that they could not um, practically get up to speed on, on a maintenance operation. They could operate the buses, they could operate the fixed route and the paratransit buses, just like they're doing in Oklahoma City, but they had no location, they had no staff, they really didn't want to mix budgets, and so throughout that negotiation, it was concluded that they would do sort of two parts. They would do the fixed routes and paratransit, and the city would take the third part, which was the maintenance of the fleet. Um, we are a big fleet maintenance operation. We have 900 vehicles in our current fleet, so everything from police cars to fire trucks to, to trash trucks and so on and so forth. Uh, so this was a fairly small addition to that operation. It was um, challenging, I wouldn't uh, diminish that, because we've never maintained buses. We really didn't have a place to do that. So. Uh, the ultimate part of that equation was that we are leasing the current transportation operations center from the University of Oklahoma where they have been maintaining these buses for about 10 years. It's a beautiful facility. I wish we owned it. Uh, we did try to negotiate for that. It wasn't going to happen with the university. So we are leasees for now and we are in the process of designing and hopefully building our own bus maintenance facility over the next year or so. So in the long run, does that save taxpayer money, not paying a third party to provide maintenance? Thank you. So the, the estimated cost of maintenance, which includes fuel, I needed to, to reinforce that. We've had that question in some of our community meetings. It seems like a large number. But the estimated cost, annual cost, is about $900,000, so approaching a million dollars to maintain fuel, uh, uh, you know, parts, and so on for those 28 buses. Uh, we believe we will do it uh, cheaper. Uh, and frankly better than we might have gotten from a, a contractor um, for obvious reasons. The contractor would have overhead costs and other costs that we don't have to endure and we, as I said, we are in sort of an enveloping this process into our existing fleet maintenance system. Also proud to say that we are doing this with uh, uh, only three new staff members. Uh, we have three new mechanics, a crew chief among them, that are operating in the uh, TOC there at OU who are doing all of this maintenance. I think that's remarkable that we were able to take that on with only three new staff members. And then Taylor's position as a transit coordinator is the fourth one. So we've really only added four full-time staff members in the city's organization to manage this, this uh, very uh, challenging program. The value of contracting with Embark is that they had to add another probably 35 to 40 employees in their operation to manage uh, the, the Norman system. Well, not to mention that if the maintenance was in Oklahoma City, you would add more mileage and have higher gas expenses. Thank you. Exactly. So it's it's definitely more practical to have it here in Norman. Yeah. Great. Um, so another question, kind of in terms of that maintenance. Um, let me find it here. Why did Norman not inspect and repair bay? The repair bay city taxpayers are leasing to find out if the it doesn't lift a bus it's broken uh, thus some maintenance can't be performed and require ou to lease a working stall instead of this broken one great question i'm not aware that we have a broken system so i'll, I'll follow up after this uh, i'm certainly not aware of that and that's not been a problem for us we are leasing two stalls in their garage uh, they're excellent space we're using all their resources uh, with our, our own people uh, and i would say that we did extraordinary due diligence in our process uh, throughout the previous months before july i was there on multiple occasions myself all of our operators were there embark visited the site multiple times we knew exactly what we were getting into and i gotta say i, I visited other transit maintenance facilities in the region uh, this year as well uh, this is probably the finest transit maintenance facility <coughs> in oklahoma 
Uh, so we are very fortunate to be able to lease that space. And if we've got some equipment temporarily broken down, that's, that's not a big issue to resolve that. And the university has stepped up in every other way to help us uh, to be a good um, you know, uh, operator of their space. I should clarify that this um, transportation operations center uh, is the central uh, location for all of transportation services at the University of Oklahoma. So side by side, we are maintaining the Norman buses. Uh, the uh, OU facility is maintaining the OU buses. They're also maintaining all the other OU um, vehicles and fleet uh, systems that they have, which is hundreds of vehicles operated by the university. So uh, no, the, the, work, the system is working well and the space is, is terrific. Great. That's great to hear. Yeah. Uh, we don't have an issue with the broken yeah. stall. Um, and this might be a question I'm not sure better suited for Catherine or um, maybe Sean. Why did Norman let OU keep the profitable, pro profitable routes and good buses? Shouldn't Norman have taken over everything? Um, Norman should have said that the city can't take it, o it over until a proper financial analysis with an operations maintenance tail is calculated. And I can even chime in on that to start. Uh, I don't think you'll find a public transit system anywhere in the United States that is profitable. Uh, they are all operated at taxpayer subsidy. Uh, the fact that the University of Oklahoma wanted to keep specific routes uh, reflects the ridership profile for those specific routes and they are primarily student demanded. And uh, um, it would be up to the university at this point to change those routes or amend those routes to provide a better level of student transportation services. Those routes are not limited to student populations only. They are accessible by the general public, as well as the students' um, opportunity to ride the rest of the new Norman public transit system. Uh, but those routes were specifically geared towards that student population primarily, and they are still operated uh, under a subsidy from the University of Oklahoma. And additionally, are those routes on um, mostly, they do have a lot of interaction uh, right around uh, the campus and do run right through the middle of the campus. There, there's effectively four routes that they operate. Um, the primary route and, and really the beginning of this system is that, that bus system from Lloyd Noble parking lot into the campus. Lots of students come and park there and drive uh, on the bus into the campus. The other thing I would add to Daryl's comments, he was right on point, <clears throat> is that the University of Oklahoma for many years has been collecting a transportation or transit fee from all of their students. I have a freshman there this, this semester. I know what I'm paying for <laughs> his transportation fee. Um, so they are required to provide a transportation system to their students as by virtue of that fee. And I know throughout our negotiations that was a very important point for them, for the university team, to continue providing that service that they are collecting fees for. Previously, those fees were, were melded into the budget for the CART system, and that was, as Anthony mentioned earlier, that was one of the motivators, I think, for the university to get out of the public transportation business and focus their revenues on just student services, which really makes sense if you think about it. If I might talk a little bit about that as well, just remember that a lot of the students uh, at the University of Oklahoma, actually all of the students at the University of Oklahoma Norman campus, are residents and citizens of Norman. Um, so while the university maintains those routes that are serving just the on-campus facilities and the OU-owned apartments to get to campus, there are a lot of residents of Norman who are students at the University of Oklahoma who ride the bus and live in apartments, particularly on the near east side of town along the Luxy and that sort of, those, those apartments and those sorts of things that ride the West Lindsay or the East Lindsay routes into, into the bus terminal that are on city provided buses. So this relationship between the university and the city continues and will continue because of that relationship with our student residents and citizens of Norman. Yes. Um, another question from Daryl. Buses, broken stalls, and um, the worst routes. <clears throat> well, 
this was all part of an extended negotiation process, so, so this is something that happened by agreement. Um, I think we've addressed the bus situation. We got some new buses, they got some, some newer buses, and then uh, the, the rest of the fleet was uh, 2015 or older. Um, and that was just part of the negotiation. Uh, the service bays are working. Um, so I, I'm not sure there's any cause for a lawsuit at this point. No one's in any violation of any agreements. Great. So knowing that this is kind of the first of this kind in the country, is that right, Sean? This transfer of services, an established service. Um, so it's kind of an extraordinary situation in developing these agreements and so maintaining this balance between OU and the city of Norman is important and um, is there anything that you'd like to add to that? I would just add that um, we think there might be some remote example up in northeast part of the country um, many years ago but um, the Federal Transit Administration like any federal government agency is divided up into regions we are in Region 6, which is based in Fort Worth, Texas. And as we're dealing with those professionals down there, that was the first thing we learned is that they really hadn't been through this elsewhere. Now, like any good federal government uh, agency, there is guidance. There would, they could hand us the circulars and say, this is what you're supposed to do uh, in order to make this happen. And we did that. As, as the mayor mentioned, it literally took an act of, the, of our governor to make the transfer of the grant recipient status to the city. Um, so we followed all those steps, but we didn't have, a, a, as I would have hoped, we didn't have another city or a, another transit agency to call and say, hey, what did you do when you encountered this, or what problems did you have? That is always better. We, we've all been through this in city government where we've taken over some system or some program we had never done before. It's always helpful to talk to those who have been there before you. And so that was part of our challenge. We, we encountered a lot of uh, of unanswered questions throughout those months leading up to June and July that we just had to stumble our way through. Uh, FTA was wonderful. Um, there is a, a, a liaison to transit at the Oklahoma Department of Transportation. Uh, she and her staff were terrific to work with. We got nothing but cooperation and support from all of the players, including the university and everyone else in the picture. Uh, but it was just new. It was just uh, unchartered territory, and we certainly made a few mistakes along the way and things we'd like to have to do over. Uh, but we've, we've gotten through it, and, and as I've said earlier, the system really is uh, operating very well. A lot of credit uh, to Embark, who ultimately allowed us to make this happen. I, I think if they had not agreed to work with us, uh, we would have parked the buses for several months. We, we could not have, I'm convinced that we could not have gotten the city operation up and running or a private bus operator up and running before about now. So uh, that's remarkable, I think, that we were able to do that. And, and Sean, to further highlight the uniqueness of this particular set of circumstances, uh, when the University of Oklahoma was the public transit provider, they were awarded a $3 million grant to develop their bus barn and their maintenance facility when they made the announcement that they were going to step away from that role, they were required to reimburse the federal government for uh, that grant as they were no longer going to provide uh, services to the entire city of Norman. We made contact with the FTA and said, how do we go about getting that $3 million grant routed back to the city of Norman who will be picking up that role and is in desperate need of that new maintenance facility? And the answer was, the mechanism doesn't exist this circumstance hasn't presented itself before. So the refund that we would envision going back to the Federal Transportation Administration actually winds up just going back into the U.S. Treasury and is blended with all the other revenue that show up at the U.S. Treasury. So we're working closely with our uh, senators and our Congress representatives to come up with a mechanism to draft a bill that once again will set the trend and now provide a mechanism hopefully that if this uh, scenario repeats itself in the future in some other part of the country, a mechanism will exist to allow those federal dollars to stay uh, available to the citizens where that service will be provided. So is there hope now of getting that refund, getting that bill passed in time to get that refund, or have we lost that? We are hopeful. Uh, we are still in communication with our, our U.S. representatives. Uh, the pace of government is 
is uh, sometimes painfully slow and you go through budget processes at the federal level as well. So we are not holding our breath that the money will show up in the immediate future, but we do have hope that we will eventually uh, procure um, our own facilities with the assistance of uh, FTA grant dollars. So that money, if, if in the future it was ever acquired, would go towards the building of a facility, the same purpose that you Exactly. We think the eligibility is there. It's just a matter of waiting for the next process. Okay, great. And speaking of these uh, transfer of services and continuing the service, as Sean mentioned, um, we have a comment. The disability community relies on the paratransit. There were a lot of growing fans in the transfer of the service to Embark. Many riders were unable to obtain rides. Has this improved? Uh, uh, the uh, are and I'll, I'll take the first shot, in it, and I know everybody can chime in on this one. Um, in that transition, the University of Oklahoma went through layoff procedures and several of their staff members uh, that were not going to be affiliated with the retained routes uh, were laid off, many of whom were immediately hired by the Embark system. Timing is everything in local government, and what we recognize, the timing of this transaction of the service also uh, lined up with uh, the school district's process and their, their annual recruitment of bus drivers. So literally, the, the city of Norman Embark system was competing for the same labor pool as the school districts were for those qualified bus drivers, and there were a few drivers short. So the Paris, uh, paratransit system did suffer some slowdowns and uh, a reduction in availability for a period of time. And our last communication with Embark was that uh, they were bringing four additional paratransit drivers uh, online this week, and we should see um, a more robust paratransit service available uh, here in the coming weeks in Norman. And yeah. Sean and Taylor may have additional information on that okay. restoration of full Great, service. great summary, and I will only add to that that as part of our negotiation, um, we again just frankly could not physically reach that July first. Uh, deadline. So again, the university was kind enough to operate the entire system, so both fixed routes and paratransit, for the month of July. We needed that 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 uh, additional time. Embark took over the fixed routes uh, the first of August, so August fifth technically, and did a beautiful job. In fact, I have yet to receive a single complaint about our fixed route systems. And then the university continued operating paratransit for August and September. On October 1st, Embark took over. So as of October 1st, we feel like we are the full operator. The university is no longer in the picture with the exception of leasing their space. And we have seen dramatic improvements uh, since October 1st. Just as Daryl mentioned, it had a lot to do with staffing, drivers, dispatchers, supervisors, and so on. Let me put it into perspective for numbers. It helps some people to kind of understand what we're providing. The average day for paratransit rides is about 130 or 140 trips a day. That's a, the that's a number of calls that we get. We go to their curbside, pick them up, take them to wherever they are wanting to go, medical appointments, you name it. Um, so about 130, 140 a day. At the, at the worst of the times with the university, and I'm gonna say September, they were pushing about 80 a day. That's the best they could do, which we agreed was not acceptable. They agreed was not acceptable, but it was the best they could do. As of this week, we are back up around that 130 range. And so we think as of this week, as Daryl said, that we are back in full service, full staff, uh, buses are running. And I hope that those folks who uh, stayed with us, I appreciate their patience in August and September, are now feeling like it's back to normal, back to what they were used to. And I'd also like to think with a successful election in a couple weeks, that we will be able to improve on that system in a number of different ways whether it's more rides or whether it's better buses or whether it's better communication systems. Um, we want this system to be better than it was. No offense to our university partners, but we think we can do better here. And that's definitely one of the things that I've touched on in speaking with residents. We often hear the lack of appropriate routes and bus stops. And I fully acknowledge we don't have a bus stop at the East Library. We don't have a bus stop at the More Norman Technology Center. During the summers, we don't have a bus stop at Westwood. We don't have a bus stop south of Highway 9. You get my point. Uh, but we're looking forward to improving the system. And the biggest benefit to, I think, having our own public transit system, not through OU, is control. So again, after a successful election on November 12th, we are very much looking forward to starting the public input process 
or we reach out to the community and really dive into where do our routes need to be? What will increase ridership? Because this system needs to be valuable to everyone, not just a limited amount of residents in our community. I'd just like to make a comment about the, the operators and Embark uh, hiring them. They've done great work on uh, recruiting, training, hiring drivers. Uh, it is not a very fast process, uh, but in less than a month, we're close to being full staffed again. Um, if you can just imagine somebody coming off the street that's a good candidate, uh, they may not have their CDL, so that Embark has to get their CDL. They need to get their passenger endorsement. They need to be trained how to interact with uh, passengers on a, on a daily basis, hundreds of passengers a day, and those ADA requirements that go along with that. So there was a lot of training involved with getting operators up and running to be able to actually go on a bus and provide the service on their own. Um, and thank you all for that. And then jumping into more of what this tech could be used for, um, I don't know if this would be a question, a legal question here, um, but in the ordinance, what are some things that this tax could be used for and could not be used for? The ordinance explicitly states that it's to be used for public transit systems and other lawful purposes of the city related to public transit. I know we've gotten the question a lot about whether that includes parking, uh, parking structures, parking lots. Uh, it, it could include parking lots if they were dedicated uh, to a bus stop. Um, however, as you'll see in our in our materials, we we don't anticipate there being a lot of extra money after this tax is collected to do that. So that's definitely not the primary purpose. Uh, I think the purpose that council has directed and that what, what we anticipate the money to be used for is to operate the system as is and to improve the system. And so that's the primary focus of those dollars and that's all laid out in the ordinance that was adopted by council and it's laid out in the proposition for the voters. And, um, so this could fund any sort of parking garage that council might want as long as they have a bus stop there? No, it would have to be, well, it would have to be related to public transit. Um, so the primary purpose, I would say, would have to be related to public transit. Okay. So more like a parking ride facility? Like right. Like a city. Right, more, more of like a park and ride. I think that would be more feasible. But again, this is just providing funding to provide the basic service. Uh, there's not going to be money left over to build parking garages. It's really more for expanding the service and making it more of what the city needs uh, as far as providing service to the residents. And just as an example of, of um, the delta in the system, uh, the difference between revenues and expenses, the cost of the restoration of Saturday service could run somewhere in the neighborhood of $150,000 to bring that service back in line. So um, half of the uh, projected surplus could be consumed with the restoration of Saturday service. So really not enough money to actually buy real estate or develop parking lots, um, definitely not in the near term. But uh, opportunities to better prepare our fixed route system to interact with the regional transit authorities, longer term plans, I think that's where these two systems will really shine. Maybe Anthony, could you speak to a little bit about the projected revenue? How much do we expect the sales tax to raise? Um, based on the rate of sales tax that we're collecting now, one eighth percent would raise about two point five million dollars per year. That's a pretty solid projection. Um, we hope that it will grow somewhat um, in line with the city the sales tax generally, uh, but that's a pretty good estimate so far. Great. And how does that compare to our funding? system as was previously stated um, the total cost of running the bus system is about five and a half five point three million dollars per year we hope to get some money from the federal government but this but the public transit sales tax would be a major contributor and would, and would um, help us to, to run the system in the future yeah and like you said in several places there's 2.2 million funding gap now with the city's contribution and expected federal funds so Sounds like that tax will just about be used for just filling that current gap. That's all, yeah. There, this this idea that there'd be money left over to build parking garages, I think comes somewhat from what I have to take blame or credit for calling the fund that the funds will be recorded to the transportation and parking fund. And that goes to the, the experience that I had in Oklahoma City and that Oklahoma City has with the central Oklahoma transportation and parking authority because the concept is that um, 
by having public parking garages that are fee-based and that can make some profit, there could be some subsidy from that profit from the parking garages to the transit facility. But as Daryl says, there is no experience where transit makes a profit that can bleed over into the parking operation. So the idea is that you have this combined transportation and parking system where the parking can have uh, hopefully subsidize some of the transit operation. So what you're saying is that rather than this public transit tax going to build parking facilities that would for produce money for the city, that really the parking facilities that are already in operation, that are already generating revenue, or ones that we might create in the future, would instead go to fund public transportation? That's the concept, yes ma'am. Got it. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, we do have some more questions here. Um, thanks for answering those. and especially related to the parking uh, question. So because it is going into the public transportation and parking fund, um, will this tax end, when will this tax end? If the RTA, Regional Transit Authority, funds the bus system, could we continue this tax to fund parking facilities? I'll defer to Catherine on the wording of the ordinance, but the idea is that if the Regional Transit Authority provides bus systems from within the RTA or the regional um, sales tax, then this um, sales tax would expire independently because there would be a new funding source to pay for the bus system from the regional system. That's absolutely correct, and you'll see that in the proposition language. Uh, it says that the tax will end upon successful adoption and implementation of of a dedicated funding source for public bus operations in Norman, and so we're anticipating when the Regional Transit Authority comes forward with a sales tax or some other funding source that the legislation were to change to allow it, that it may be sufficient to fund our bus operations. We don't want citizens to be double taxed for the bus operations, so there's language in here to, that would cause this tax to sunset if the RTA tax were to be approved and implemented and is sufficient to cover bus operations, not bus and parking, but bus operations. And getting into some of those costs, are there ways that we could reduce costs to the current system, um, such as using smaller buses or using Uber? I mean, the if you look at the financial breakdown, I think that it ends up being about ten dollars per rider. And um, can you talk to about if we could use Uber or what are some other options for that? You bet, and that's exactly the question that all transit agencies are asking themselves and have been for literally decades, um, and we will be asking ourselves that as well, whether it, as you mentioned, whether it's more efficient buses, electric, there's an electric bus coming on the market this year, uh, so is that another way to uh, both save money and be a little more environmentally um, conscious? Um, smaller buses to larger buses, uh, more efficient operational systems, cheaper gas, any number of, of the big ticket items. And I think, yes, we we hope after one year of operation, we kind of get our feet on the ground, we'll know where we can improve in that area, just like we do in every one of our operations today, whether it's public works operations for uh, street maintenance or whether it's the parks maintenance operation, we are always looking at more efficient ways to deliver our services, and that will be true for transit. Um, this business of, of Uber and other services, I, I think part of the movement in this state and in this country is to think broader about transportation, public transportation. So we need to think about the term mobility is, is what is being sort of born out of that effort. And mobility services can be provided by cities, by universities, by private operations like Uber and Lyft. And so it's all part of one big transportation system. But public transportation, like we're talking about here, is very, very necessary to certain members of our community. You mentioned earlier the disabled members of our community. Uber does not cater to disabled uh, members or, or mobility devices. They can't ride those with their wheelchairs and other devices. It's also considerably more expensive than our system. If we're charging 75 cents a ride, Uber's charging $10 a ride. That's not really conducive to folks who, who are on limited um, uh, budgets. And so, yeah, I think that's exactly right. As we go forward, we're going to find even more efficient ways to run the system. But it's also been mentioned that there's a desire in Norman 
for more services. So we're, where we will save some, I hope, uh, I think there's going to be a request of the council and the, and the city to provide Saturday service again. There will be. Uh, there will, <laughs> absolutely will be. Oh, there has been. Every meeting we've been at. Or to provide those connections to the new senior center, more Norman Technology, East Central, or East Library, Central Library. We don't provide a stop there today yet. Working on that right now. Um, so I, while, while we will always find ways to be more efficient with our dollars and maybe find some more revenues. I think there, the demand for services here is going to grow just like it is in Oklahoma City and Tulsa and Albuquerque and Dallas. Um, we are becoming a, a bigger metropolitan area and as the mayor has said many times, great cities have great public transportation systems. We want to be one of those. And Sean, can I, I, I ask uh, Taylor to help clean this up for me, but a lesson I learned from our transit coordinator related to the size of the buses that people see uh, on the routes and they may see a what looks like a relatively large bus that isn't full so it looks like there are inefficiencies built into the system and as uh, Taylor described to me the size of the bus uh, has a lot to do with the configuration to provide ADA accessibility and as the buses get smaller the uh, ADA accessible features begin to disappear from those um, uh, buses that are currently manufactured and available to us uh, as part of our fleet so I'd love Taylor to chip in a little bit and clean that up and, and describe how the size of the bus works uh, yeah. related to our routes. He told me a story about that too, about the potential of not having enough space for disabled people if more than one would want to ride the bus at a time and what that might look like. Right, thank you. Uh, so I want to make clear that uh, all the buses that we provide are ADA accessible as they have to be by federal regulation, but um, things get tighter. Um, the, the wheelchair, uh, securement areas uh, you may go from four or three securement areas in a larger bus down to three or two you know you just lose the capacity and um, unfortunately if there aren't enough uh, locations on a bus for a mobility device to be secured then the user may have to uh, wait for the next bus to come around on the route uh, to pick them up and so there are some there's some benefits like Sean was saying for uh, efficiencies maybe you get uh, six miles to the gallon rather than five on a, on a smaller bus um, you can make tighter turns, you can go in uh, areas that uh, you otherwise couldn't with a larger bus, but there are some things to think about uh, and truly with ADA accessibility on a larger bus that we have to, when we're procuring new vehicles, we have to put it in the grand perspective. And how do the City of Norman's current buses compare to like, are they pretty big buses or what are the largest buses you could get? Are we running small, the smallest bus we could while maintaining ADA mm -hmm. compliance? So again, all the vehicles that we purchase have to be ADA compliant uh, because we are a federal, and oh, you had to, so the ones that we inherited are, um, are all ADA compliant. The largest, I think we do have uh, one 40-foot bus in our fleet. Um, it's usually a reserve bus, uh, and we use it on uh, a couple routes, but generally the majority of our buses are 35 and 30-foot buses that um, kind of rotate in and out around the, around the city, and generally those serve our needs pretty well. Again, uh, when you get away from campus, uh, the streets get a little tighter, the turns, uh, you don't want to be going over the yellow line when you're turning right, those kind of things. And 35 foot buses and 30 foot buses are generally better on our city streets than 40 foot. So we do have a good makeup of those two types of vehicles. And for like the lay person, is a 35 foot bus pretty small compared to other buses or is that the smallest we could get? No, uh, generally the smallest city bus or transit bus that people think about, um, the low floor, is about a 30 foot bus. So they usually come in 30, 35, and 40 foot. So we're already running some pretty short buses, some pretty small buses. Right. And I'd just like to chime in about the, the Uber and the, the transportation network uh, companies as they're commonly referred to as. I think um, they're generally viewed as a complementary service to transit agencies, kind of the first mile, last mile service. So you uh, take a bus out to uh, a, a bus stop on the east side of town, and then uh, these, these companies could come in and uh, provide a service from the most outerlying bus stops to uh, residences and back, so that the way they can access the transit system easier. Um, and I think Sean's right, it's all about mobility and how do all of these services complement each other, um, both private, public, university, and make it where all citizens can access uh, more modes Better. And I can see a reason why we might not want to get entirely out of the bus system and rely on services like Uber, not just because
because of the ADA compliance, but because those are for-profit organizations and they have the ability to raise their prices as they will. Um, sure. So I think in the future that's hard to guarantee that we are using taxpayer money to the best of our ability if we're relying on a for-profit organization. Right. And these uh, companies do provide uh, good mobility for individuals, but um, as uh, public transit was called uh, all, and still is referred to mass transit, uh, we're really called to move a lot of people um, around their city in b bigger vehicles so to be more efficient that way. And I think that's where the complimentary piece comes in. We're, um, we're not necessarily trying to be an Uber, we're trying to be public or mass transit. And that helps with traffic congestion and wear on roads, generally moving more people in one vehicle, doesn't it? Right. And as we, as we do things that kind of increase ridership or help open up the bus system to more residents such as you know expanding our services or um, adding back Saturday service wouldn't that make the cost per rider go down absolutely uh, just some numbers that might be helpful for, for folks uh, based upon our best calculations we carried over 300,000 or provided over 300,000 rides last year on this system um, the university uh, rides are exclusive of that number we also provided over 32,000 paratransit rides, which is a large number. And, and, and absolutely, the goal is always to increase those numbers, provide more services therein, reducing your cost per service or cost per ride. We're also very interested in transferring more services in to the fixed route system, the larger buses, and fewer of those rides on the paratransit side uh, because it is more efficient to do that. It is more cost effective to provide the fixed route uh, services. And that's what you'll find in many transit systems around the country. Their fixed route program is uh, much larger than their paratransit program. In Norman, or the system that we inherited from the university, it's about half and half. About half of our funding goes to fixed routes and the other half goes to paratransit, which is very unique to this system in Norman. Sean uh, hit on a point that I think is just valuable information for all of us to keep in the back of our minds. For folks who are not regular mass transit or public transit users, imagine your daily commute or your daily uh, run for errands and you know after school sporting events if those 330 plus thousand rides were all taking place in individual cars. How many more um, cars on the road uh, would you be sharing with and, and how many more stoplights would you not quite make? So it really is uh, an advantage to have mass transit for folks who utilize mass transit and for those folks who do not. And um, because we are in Norman and we are dealing with this issue right now, maybe um, this is kind of a question for Anthony and Catherine. Why could or could you not use the University of North Park funds to pay for bus services in the future? Um, by the, by statute, under the Local Development Act, those funds can only be used for projects in the designated project area. Uh, typically, those are public improvements or things like that. Uh, we have an adopted project plan that outlines those. Uh, even if we were to end the University of North Park TIF, which we're undergoing that process now, um, it doesn't provide sufficient funding for public transit. Uh, under the proposed amendments, it would end the sales tax apportionment effective June 30th, 2019. We budgeted based on that, and we still have a $2.5 million shortfall for public transit, even counting those dollars all coming into our general fund. That's a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that. Um, so I think while we're on that topic, let's talk what happens if this fails to pass? What does that look like for our bus service and for our our budget? Um, well, as was mentioned, there's a $2.2 million annual shortfall between all of these revenue sources that we are counting on um, and the ability to provide public transit services at the cost that we're projecting to provide them now. Um, in this fiscal year, 2019-2020, um, the council decided to continue those services and just basically draw down enough general fund balance to pay for them. But we can't continue to do that in the future without a new revenue source. So what will have to happen is that 
some difficult decisions will have to be made. Something will have to be cut, either in the transit system or in some other general fund provided service. Um, so, so again, I won't speculate on what those decisions might be, but just understand that the bottom line is the bottom line. There's a $2.2 million gap that will have to come from someplace in the general fund. Great. And um, back to funding, uh, we have another comment here that says, I need to check into the cost of wired tornado paper art in front of the new library. Maybe that should have been eliminated to and have that money better spent. I know that, that was part of the Norman Forward. Yes, ma'am. That, that's a targeted, kind of that's a targeted sales tax for Norman Forward. Uh, and it's not, what do you call it, Why the paper tornado? <laughs> <Yeah. tournament. laughs> it's actually called Unbound, and it's actually a nationally and internationally recognized public art piece. But it is from a separately earmarked sales tax for Norman Forward that paid for that. And it's not subject to spending for public transit. So actually the fact that we couldn't just eliminate that and spend that money on whatever we wanted is a good thing because we have to abide by the tax laws. And exactly. The, we, the, the voters said they forward. wanted to use that portion of their sales tax for Norman Forward. Okay. There is a, a, a point in that conversation related to the use of one-time money to solve an ongoing funding gap. Uh, if, we, if, if we had the latitude to eliminate public artwork, uh, at a point those one-time dollars are spent and the demand for public, con, uh, public transportation continues. So what we're looking for is an ongoing revenue stream um, and the utilization of one-time dollars. You know, if the flexibility would have been there for uh, University North Park money or Norman Forward money, uh, those are still very limited in duration, and we believe mass transit or public transit is part of the fabric of our community and will be here uh, well into the future. That's great. Um, well, I'm kind of out of questions here, so as we're wrapping up, are there any final comments that anybody would like to make? I'd like to make one. Uh, first of all, to my friends and among friends, I hear you're watching today. I hope you're doing well and staying warm out there. But I think we have a unique opportunity to fund a vital government service that will not raise sales tax rates above its current levels. I understand that people get frustrated that we fund government services with sales tax and I share your frustration. We are literally the only state in the United States of America that ties cities general funds to sales tax as its main source of revenue. So that's not us. It's not our choice. We understand that sales tax is regressive, but again, we have the timing opportunity to not raise sales tax above its current levels and not just maintain, but hopefully enhance a service that I hope to see grow as regional transit becomes a, a thing. And I know many people are excited about that. In our recent presentation from Marion Hutchison, who is our delegate, if you will, to the Regional Transit Authority of Central Oklahoma, he pointed out that when that comes online, the first thing they work on is a bus system. So not only are we going to continue a service that is being used now, but we're setting ourselves up for success with regional transit ahead of other cities. And I'm very excited to make this investment, and I need you to vote yes on November 12th. That's great. And we do have, um, we've brought up another question there. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> but how will this not raise above current tax levels? How is that possible? Perfect. So our current sales tax rate is 8.75%. The Cleveland County has a quarter percent sales tax that funded the construction of the county jail, which has long been built. And I appreciate our partners being good stewards of those sales tax dollars because that quarter percent will expire in March 2020. When passed, see that optimism, on November 12th, this 8% will come online when that one expires. So there's no overlap. And so the 8.75% is the cap, essentially. That one goes away and this one comes online. So that's how we're not going to see a sales tax increase. And um, how does, and this might be a question for Anthony actually, how does Norman's tax level compare to tax rates among other states or even other cities in Oklahoma? I've heard the comment often that Norman has one of the highest tax rates, effective tax rates in the country. No, that's, that's false. Um, Oklahoma generally tends to have higher sales tax rates than most cities um, in other states because of the dependence on sales tax in Oklahoma compared to any other state in the United States. But Norman's kind of average. Um, 
um, it kind of depends um, on the county tax rate as to how high the all-in tax rate will be for a city in Oklahoma. But for cities in Oklahoma, Norman is kind of average. Um, we're, we're right in the middle. Now are there any final comments? <laughs> I wanted to make a final comment about just stepping back um, about this public service of public transit. Um, and I ride the bus every day with a guy named Steve. Great guy, personable, friendly guy. Um, he's a grandfather. He works in Oklahoma City and lives in Norman. But Steve is blind. Um, and. And he, for that reason, he can't drive. So he, he rides the bus to work in Oklahoma City every day. Um, he gets off as I'm getting on. Um, his coworkers pick him up, takes him to his job. Um, he gets off the bus in Norman. His family picks him up and takes him home. He's transit dependent, but that doesn't mean he's not a great guy. And, and this is a service that should be provided for folks like him. Uh, Taylor mentioned, I learned a new word today. He said securement area. Um, well, when you're riding the bus, there's these areas that are reserved for disabled people, right? Um, and, and they do, they take up a lot of space. If there are two disabled people riding at the same time, that's, that is six seats being taken up. But those securement areas are very necessary and they're very uh, sophisticated in order to secure a person in a wheelchair, you have to strap them in from the back and from the front and from the sides. Because remember, if you don't have the use of your arms or your legs, you can't grab on if the car or the bus is, is going like this. Um, so it's very necessary and it's a very specialized thing that has to be in these vehicles. And this is a service that needs to be provided for those residents of our city who are differently able. There while you're talking about that, of course, um, you know that this is also important to get the disability community active in the community for things like community service or getting to get out and vote as well. Mm -hmm. The only thing I would add, if I may, Anthony said it better than I could have ever said it about that element, but it's not just the disability community. These are seniors. These are folks who can't drive for other reasons. These are folks who don't own a car, can't own a car for, for various reasons. It's their way to get to their job. We've heard this from our public meetings that people are not able to get to their jobs on Saturday because the Saturday service went away. So there are many, many people in Norman and in every community that depend on public transportation. Uh, for most of us, that's not a problem. Most of us own cars and, and drive cars, especially in Oklahoma. But there is a, a very uh, significant and important sector of our community that, that this is not a luxury. This is a necessity for them, for their lives, for their, uh, uh, for their ability to, to function like the rest of us do. And so it's, I don't think, I think it's an option. It's we have to do this in some form. And it's really, I think uh, in a couple of weeks, this election is a referendum on that, on public transportation in Norman. How do we feel about it? Uh, should we provide it? And should we make it better? And I think what I'm hearing from most folks we've talked to is yes, yes, yes. We should do all those things. Um, and I hope that people will get out to vote. That's the key message here. It, we, uh, we have to hear from you and you have your opportunity to speak in two weeks. Well, with that, thank you all very much for attending and uh, we'll continue to answer questions on Facebook or as they come in and we hope that you all will join us on November 5th for our next discussion of this kind. Um, it'll be broadcast at 2 p.m. So we'll see you then. Thanks. Thank you.